Every programming language has to provide some ways of branching, making decisions in code as it runs. A procedure may need to execute one statement if the condition is true, and perhaps execute a second statement if the condition is false. .NET provides several different techniques for making decisions as code executes, and we'll look at those in this chapter. Code can make decisions as it's executing. We have if statements and single line if statements. That is, you can have an if statement with multiple statements, and a single line if statement is just a single line of code executed if some condition is true. You can have an if else statement where you execute one block of code if a condition is true and another block of code if it's not. We can have nested if statements, make choices and within either the if or the else portion, have another if else statement, nested as deep as you like. We can have multiple conditions, that is if statements that test for multiple things linked together and we can compare a condition to a single value, making choices based on the current value of that expression. Well, let's start by looking at if statements. An if statement allows you to execute a block of code if a condition is true, and skips the code if the condition isn't true. You can use this if statement in different ways, depending on whether you want to execute a single statement or a block of statements. You can also execute one block if a statement is true and another if it's false. Well, let's stop and look at some examples of the if statement. I've loaded the sample project for this chapter, which is branching flow control, and I've run it, and I'm going to step into a bunch of different procedures to try out working with various kinds of loops. So I'll press letter A to test a simple if statement. Now here's the concept. I'm going to attempt to find out if a file exists or not. Now at this point, I have up here at the top a using statement for system.io, so I can use the system.io namespace without having to worry about typing system.io each time. Okay, so here I'm going to step in, and I've asked for the file, but I check to see if it exists or not before I attempt to work with it. If I didn't, I'd be working with a file that wasn't there and all the code would fail after this. So if the file exists, I'll run the code inside this block. If the file doesn't exist, I won't run the block of code inside here. So let's try it. And clearly, it seems to work. And since the file exists, I can call the readAllText method of the file class to read all the text out of that file name, because I know it's there, and I can see that on the screen. I'll display on the output the contents of my file. Like all the other chapters in this course, we're using a console menu. This is a class that we wrote to be able to display this menu up here on the screen. It uses concepts that we won't discuss till the very end of the course. So if you're interested, you can look at the source code for it. But until you actually have learned everything in the course, it's not going to make a whole lot of sense. So for now, we just skip right over it. Okay, well that's your standard if statement. Now we can take that same if statement and treat it as a single line. For example, let me step into B. Here we go. Now here, since I'm only using a single statement, I could, if I wanted to, I'll step in here, there we go. We could at this point check to see if the file exists and have the then statement on the same line of code. Notice. At the end of this line, there's this space, underscore, and a carriage return. That means this is all the same logical line of code, even though it's broken up into two physical lines. If I come along and delete that, moving it all onto the same line of code, that's really what I have. One big long line of code, which I've broken up into two by pressing the Enter key after an underscore there. In any case, I don't recommend you write code this way. It does work, though. If the file exists, we'll display in the output window the value we get by calling the readAllText method. This doesn't include an end if statement because it's just a single line of code. It's not a block of code. The reason I don't recommend this is because sooner or later, you're going to want to make this have multiple lines of code. Then you're going to have to stop go to that block of code, add an end if, and move this around. You know, start changing code. Now you can add multiple lines of code. 
Since you know that sooner or later you're going to need to do this, why don't you just write the code like this in the first place? The only place I use single line if statements is where it's something that's really simple, like this. If x equals 1, then o console.write line hello. Something that simple. In that case, I might use a single line if statement. Otherwise, it's just not worth the hassle. We can also have an if else statement. Let's try that. Step into this. Now, I'm asking for a number here. I'll enter a number like 15. Let's see what the code's doing. We're going to attempt to parse the value. Now, in an earlier example, you saw me use a case where I just called the cint method to convert from string to number. The try parse method is easier to use because it never raises an exception. Try parse says, I'm going to attempt to take this value and put it into this number. If it succeeds, I'll return true. If it fails, I'll return false. So if this expression is true, then we'll display this output. If it's not, we'll come to the else statement and we'll display this output instead. So try parse is a really useful method that all the numeric classes provide, an integer, single, double, and so on, as an easy way to attempt to get value from a string into that data type. It does require that you create a variable to hold the output. So here, I pass that number in as a variable, and they fill it in for me. Actually, this code should do something like, I don't know what, uh, console.writeLine, the value is, and display the value. So you can see that you got it converted. It doesn't prove much to do that here, but we could. OK, so in this case, if I step into it, we entered a valid number, so we're out of there. Let's try it again, but this time, select a value that isn't a valid number. So let's go in again. I'll enter my name, step into the code. If try parse succeeds, we'll display you entered a valid number. If it fails, we display invalid input. There we go. So with an if else statement, we're able to make choices running one block of code if a condition succeeds, another block of code if it fails. What if you want to nest if else statement? You can. Let's try an example. Again, I'll enter a number, say 15. And in this case, if we manage to parse the number, we can have another if else statement inside that. So if we parsed it, if the number is 0, we handle that specially. If it's not 0, we display something else. And if we didn't manage to enter a valid number, we would see the invalid input display. So here we're checking for three different things. Did I enter a number or not? That's this first if statement. If I did enter a number, is it 0 or not? So we've nested that if statement and can make choices once we've already made a decision. In this case, the number is not 0, so we display you entered a valid number. Let's try it again. I'll enter this time 0. We come in. It did parse correctly. The number is 0, so we say enter a value. For some reason, 0 isn't valid in this example. Who knows why? OK. Now, in every case we've seen so far, we test a condition. We make a choice based on it. What if we wanted to test for a number of different things? For example, I'm going to ask the user for a drive letter. If the drive is ready, we do one thing. If it's not, we do something else. If the drive type indicates that it isn't a hard drive, we want to ask the user for something else. If the total free space is not less than, say, some number, we want to tell them there's not enough free space. And finally, if we choose a drive that's ready, that's a hard drive, that has enough free space, will tell the user that the drive is acceptable. Let's try it. I'll enter a drive letter. Say C. Now here's our code. It says, and I gotta need some more space here. Let's clear up some of these windows. There we go. If the string containing the drive we just entered is null or empty, we're out of here. It means I entered a, a carriage return or didn't enter anything at all. Well, it's in this case, 
It certainly isn't null or empty. That string dot is null or empty is a very useful method. I use it all the time to make sure that when I ask for input, I get input. There is a drive info class that's provided by the system.io namespace that allows me to get information about a drive on my computer. The drive letter is C, and I'm going to ask for a new drive info object passing to that constructor my drive letter C. Now this is a concept we haven't really talked about. We're creating a new instance of that drive info class telling it which drive we want to work with. We'll discuss this sort of thing in more detail when we talk about objects. But for now, we'll take it for granted that this just works. So now, if that drive info is ready, or if it's not ready actually, we have a problem. But it must be ready. If the drive type isn't a fixed drive, we'd complain but it must be a fixed drive. If the total free space is less than 1 million bytes, then we complain about that, but it's obviously not. So the drive is acceptable. And there we are. Let's try it again. This time, I'll try drive A. Okay, it wasn't null or empty. Is it ready? Mm, nope, not ready. The drive isn't ready, so we'll prompt the user with that information and then we're out of here. Notice we didn't look at any of the other statements because we found one that was true. Not info dot is ready. This statement is a true statement. Is ready was false. Not false is true. So since the expression is true, we run the code inside there and skip over every other statement here. Else if is another keyword provided by Visual Basic that allows you to make separate choices. So this block says, if this is true, do this. Else if this is true, then do this. Else if this is true, then do this. Otherwise, if none of the other ones were true, do this one. We're done with that block of code, and we're out of here. OK. Now that's a great way to handle multiple different conditions. If we wanted to check a lot of different values for a single condition, there's another code block that's better for that, the select case statement. If you're comparing one expression to multiple values, how do you write that code? You could use an if else if block. If the expression is equal to 1, do this code. If the expression is equal to 2, do this code. But it's better to use a select case statement. The select case statement is easiest when comparing one expression to multiple values because you end up with less code and your code is easier to comprehend. Let's say you ask the user for information about a drive letter. And once they give you a drive letter, you want to be able to determine what kind of drive it is by comparing the drive type property to a number of different possible values. You could do it a number of different ways. Let's start by doing it the way you might think of doing it with a bunch of if else if statements. I'll press F to drop into this and let's get a little more real estate here to work on. There we go. Let's ask the user for a drive letter. Okay, so say enter C. If that string isn't null or empty, we'll keep going. We'll create a new instance of the drive info class passing in the drive you specified. Okay, now I want to be able to tell what kind of drive this is. And so I'll compare the drive type property against one of many different drive type enumerated values, CD-ROM, fixed, network, removable, and so on. In this case, it wasn't a CD-ROM. It was fixed. And so we'll return that we have a hard drive. Now, the order of these does sort of matter. That is the order of the if statements here, because it's going to match against the first one that happens to match. So if more than one of these match the condition, it'll match the first one that happens to match. In this case, it's a fixed drive, so we see that we got a hard drive. Great. If I come in and enter now, say, drive, let's come back over here, drive A, here we go. It's not a CD-ROM, it's not fixed, it's not network, it's removable. So we end up here. Notice that not only do we have this complicated code with a lot of comparisons? We have to look at each option to see which one is right. There we go, removable drive, we're out of there. 
Well, that code is a little wordier than it needs to be. A better solution might be to use a select case statement. Let's try G instead. In this case, we're still going to ask for the drive letter from the user. I'll type C back in our code. We still check to see if it's null or empty. We still create the drive, but look at the code here. This says, let's select the case based on the drive type. And then we have a bunch of case statements. We don't look at each one in turn. There's an internal lookup table that jumps immediately to the value that matches. So it's not only cleaner, it's a little more efficient too. And we jump right to the fixed one and display that we got a hard drive. Let's try it again now with the letter A. I'll step into it. Here we go. And we jump right to removable and hit that spot. Now one last wrinkle to this is if I come along and enter a drive that doesn't exist at all, like Z, come back to the code, we jump right away to case else. Case else is what happens if none of the other cases get matched. It's always a good idea to have a case else so you handle unusual circumstances. In this case, well, I got a drive that really doesn't exist. And so, we'll see on the screen, if I press F5 to let it run, what's up with this drive? So we've used select case to replace multiple if and else if statements. The select case is really simple to use, but you need to notice some specific details. The select case statement can match on a literal value, a property, or a calculated expression. You can include a case statement for each value that you'd like to compare to. You can use any value type expression in the select case statement. That is, if you can use equals to compare it, it'll work in the select case statement. Case statements can also include comparisons other than equality. That's the default. That's all we've used so far. But you can compare on other expressions. We'll see an example of that. Case statements can include a comma delimited list of values. So if you want to say if the expression is this or this or this or this, you can put them as a comma delimited list of values in a single case statement. Visual Basic evaluates the case statements from top to bottom. As soon as it finds one that matches, it no longer looks at any of the other case statements. If no other cases match, Visual Basic executes code in the else block instead. Let's look at an example that takes advantage of some of these features. In this example, we're going to try something a little more complicated. I'll choose option H, more select case, and in this case, that was a pun, we're going to enter a number grade and determine what kind of letter corresponds to that number grade. And I've made this a little more complicated than I had to just to prove some points. So let's come in here and get a number grade from a user. I'll say 72. We come in and we have select case based on that value. We did a parse or try parse on that number. We've converted it into a number from a string. And now we'll do a select case based on the value. Now here I have case is greater than or equal to 90. If you're going to do any comparison other than equals, you use the is keyword followed by the operator you care about. So case is greater than or equal to 90. Now remember, Visual Basic looks at these in the order it finds them. So is the number greater than or equal to 90? No. Is it greater than or equal to 80? No. So we end up on this case. But imagine that we had put this case first, or say we'd put this case first, sorry, and enter a number like 85, or even 95. Ooh, that's the example. Let's say this case was first and we entered 95. If this was the first case, even though this is a better match for it, it would use the first case it found that worked. Now in this case, if the number is greater than 90, we've weeded it out here. So here, case is greater than or equal to 80 isn't ambiguous. We've already weeded out everything greater than 90, so this will only match values that are greater than or equal to 80 or less than 90 in that range. Okay, in this case, it wasn't greater than 90, wasn't greater than 80. Instead, it's got to be matching on this one. Notice that as I single step through the code here, it behaves differently than it did before. When I was just checking on equality, Visual Basic knew ahead of time which match it would jump to based on the number.
Here that I'm matching based on a range of numbers, can't do that anymore. It has to actually look at each of them to determine which is the right answer. Since I entered 72, we'll match against this case. 70, 71, 72, 73, and finally is greater than 73. You would never write it that way. You would say is greater than 70. But that wouldn't have given me a chance to show off the common delimited list thing. In any case, since we match something in that list, that's the one that matches we ought to see. Now notice the next one. This says case is greater than or equal to 60, is less than 70. The is less than 70 is redundant there. There's no point putting it. We've already weeded out everything that was greater than 70, so the number that's here could only be less than 70. But what the heck. Shows off the point anyway. Okay, let's try one more example, which is the same thing, except this time I'll enter a failing grade. Okay, so let's go H and walk into this again. I'll enter 35. We come in here, it's not greater than 90, it's not greater than 80, it's not one of these 70 folks, it's not greater than 60. Ah, look at that. Not what we expected, is it, a wise one? It is greater than or equal to 60 or less than 70. It's less than 70. So it matched against this case. So we're never going to see that you failed here. Boy, I didn't write this code the way I intended to. It's not using the AND operator to join those together. It's using the OR operator. So since our 35 is either greater than or equal to 60 or less than 70, we matched it here. So the 70 isn't redundant. We were actually checking a value there. You live, you learn. Use the OR when you use the comma. It stands for the word OR. Okay, so we've looked at all the different ways you can use operators mixed together with the SELECT CASE statement. You've seen how to make choices in your code. What if you want to repeat code? There are several different code constructs that allow you to run code repeatedly. We'll look at some in this section. In the next section, we'll look at some more advanced ones. You can execute code while or until a condition is or becomes true. There are lots of options here. You can execute code a fixed number of times. That's what we'll look at in the next section. Or you can execute a block of code once for each element of a collection. We'll do that in the next section, too. There are several different options available for repeating a block of code while a condition remains true. There's the while loop and the do loop. The while loop is pretty much the simplest you can do. It executes a block indefinitely while a condition remains true. What if the condition never changes? Or what if you don't look for a condition? What if you say loop while true? In that case, if the condition never changes, the code has to exit the loop on demand or you can sit there looping forever, never leaving this loop. It's more likely to exit when the condition changes state. And the examples show both of those techniques. The do loop offers greater flexibility than the while loop. Perhaps there's too much flexibility. This allows you to check the condition at the top or the bottom of the loop and allows you to loop while or until the condition remains true or changes. So you really have four options with the do loop. You can check at the top or check at the bottom. You can do until or do while. You can do loop until or loop while some condition becomes true or changes its state. Placing the check for the condition at the bottom of the loop, that is, after you've executed it once, guarantees that the code runs at least one time. If you check at the top, or you use a while loop, it's possible that you may never enter the loop. Let's look at examples that show this feature off. I'll choose option I to try a simple while loop. So here, I have a condition while true. What this indicates is that we're never getting out of this loop. While true, well, true isn't going to change its value, so we better exit manually at some point. Well, let's see. We're going to ask the user for a drive letter and allow them to press enter to quit the operation. I'll enter C. We check to make sure the drive letter that I've entered isn't null or empty. If it is null or empty, we exit the while loop. Exit while is a statement that says get out of this while loop and go to the line of code after the while loop.
Well, it wasn't null or empty, so we go to the else block. We convert it to uppercase. We get the substring starting at position 0, taking the one character, it's the first letter of the thing. If it's between A and Z, that is, if it's greater than A and less than or equal to Z, then we create a new drive info. If the drive is ready, it is, we display the number of bytes free. OK. Now the end if we hit for both those if statements, and we're at the bottom of the while loop. We loop back to the top, because it's still true. Enter a drive letter. I'll enter, say, I'll press Enter this time. OK. Now this case, because it was null or empty, we're out of there. Exit while takes to the line of code after the end of the while loop. OK. Let's try instead another while loop example. This one actually does assume that you want to check the condition before you run the loop. So in this case, we'll set a variable named drive name to have the value C in it when we create it. The value C is placed into that drive name variable at the moment we create it. And we can check here at the top of the loop, while it's not true, that string dot is null or empty returns true. So this says while the string isn't null or empty, let's run the loop. Well, it's not null or empty right now. It's C right now. So we'll ask the user for a drive letter. And of course, in a real app, I probably would use the default value, that is, prompt them here with the current default. But in a console app, that's kind of hard to do. So I'll enter a drive letter. And again, we check. If it's not null or empty, we can continue. So we do the same conversion, same checks. We're still looping because it's not null or empty. Well, it's not null or empty. It's C. We come in here, ask the user for a drive name. User enters. Enter. Come back to the code. Well, the drive name is an empty string now. So we don't go into our code at all. Loop back to the top. And this time, since the drive is null or empty, we're out of there. End of the loop, and we exit. Now that loop does require a little more effort, because you're checking to see if it's null or empty two times. It's up to you how you want to process that loop. Now there's another way to do this. I chose option K, and this allows me to try a different sort of loop. This one says, OK, I'm going to get a random number. I'm going to get a random number between 0 and 10. That's what the next method of the system.random class does. It gives me a number between the values I pass. Let's try this loop a number of different ways. Now right now, value has in it 3. I'm going to do a loop that says do while value doesn't equal 5. Just loop and get another value again. Sooner or later, the value will equal 5 and we'll be out of there. So in this case, we checked at the top of the loop. So if the value had been 5, we never would have dropped into the loop. It takes a long time to get a 5 here, doesn't it? What are we getting? Lots of numbers that aren't 5, that's for sure. Let's come along. There we go. We finally got one that was 5. OK, we get a new random number. This says do until value is 5. This is the exact same loop we had before. There is no difference between this loop and this loop. It's just a matter of how you care to write the semantics of it. Do while value doesn't equal 5 may be harder for you to understand than do until value equals 5. It's up to you. They have the exact same behavior. Each case, they'll loop until the value in that variable becomes 5. There we go. We finally got a 5. And you can see it here. Well, we don't see it here because I don't display it. We never see it displayed once it is 5. If you want to see it displayed when you get 5, you have to put the check at the bottom. So we can say do whatever you want to do, loop until value is 5. Well, right now, value is definitely 5. That's why we ended the previous loop. So even though the value is 5, we come into this loop, execute the first two lines, we get to the bottom, and what happens now? Well, since value is 5, we no longer loop. If value wasn't 5, we'd go back to the do statement and continue until value became 5. Of course, since we changed the value, we've got to go back up to the top until it becomes 5 again. But you noticed we did fall into the loop 
when the value was 5. And the other loops, the previous two, we would not have. So here we'll have to loop again until the value becomes 5 again before exiting this loop. What are we getting? All sorts of numbers that aren't 5. Look, the first one was 5. We're waiting now for another 5 until we finally get the value. Okay, we got a 5 there. We don't see it, of course, because we didn't display it again after the value is 5. And here's the same exact loop. This one, we're coming in, value is 5, and we'll fall through, and we'll loop while value doesn't equal 5. Well, of course, value is 5 right now, because we fell into the loop. It runs each of the lines in the code. Now value isn't 5, and we'll continue until the value becomes 5 again. We're looping while value doesn't equal 5. So here are four different ways to use a do loop. We have do while some condition is true, do until some condition is true, do stuff, loop until some condition is true, or do stuff, loop while some condition is true. Obviously, value finally became something that was equal to 5. OK. It's important to note that the do while loop, the last one we looked at, is sort of a holdover from VB6. You're probably better off at this point limiting yourself to the while end while loop. It's a more modern construct, and it'll give you more standardized code. With all those options, it's easy to end up with lots of different ways of handling loops if you use the do loop. You might focus on the while end while instead.